Hi there, I'm the Mythkeeper. Welcome back to my channel. This week we're taking a little bit of a departure from the gods and goddesses that we've been covering, but don't worry, they'll be back the week after this one. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do a deep dive on the nation of Varicia. This is my longest video to date, uh, by far my longest. So please use the chapter titles to find the content that's most relevant to you and your players. We're going to cover the whole history of Varicia. We're going to talk about the major cities in Varicia. We're going to talk about the various factions in Varicia. Uh, Varicia sort of sits at the center of the geopolitics of the inner sea. So uh, this is a really rich video, and I wanted to cram as much good content as I could into it. Also, interestingly, Varicia is a place that changed between first edition and second edition. So uh, this is the map. Uh, of Varicia in first edition, and now in second edition, you'll see the map has changed because they've introduced this other kingdom of New Thassalon uh, that's now part of the map. So I'm going to be covering, I'm going to be touching a little bit on New Thassalon in the video proper, uh, and I'm going to be covering a little bit about uh, both those nations in this video. Uh, I think there's some really good content here, so enjoy. Varicia is a sprawling region caught between the southern nations of Taldor's old empire and the northern lands traditionally ruled by the Ulfin and Kelid people. Unlike most of the other nations we will be covering in this video series, Varicia is not a united land. It's not a nation at all. Rather, it is a collection of independent city-states, each exerting a varying amount of influence into the surrounding countryside, although it is trending towards some kind of unification as time goes on. The Prehistory of Varicia one of the first notable events to occur in the prehistory of Varicia was the arrival of the Callborn, telepathic planar scholars hailing from the ethereal plane, who came to the region perhaps sometime during the Age of Serpents, or even earlier during the Age of Creation. They constructed the ancient hexagonal city called Kermaga at the edge of the Storval Plateau, but why and how they did so is a mystery lost to time. Sometime later, the elves came to Varicia through the first Ayudara, or Waygates, and in this part of the world, they settled in the Mirani woodlands. The region that encompasses modern-day Varicia was once the site of an ancient empire called Thassalon. This empire existed in the waning years of the Age of Legend, and it was founded sometime around the year minus 6500, and it was destroyed in the year minus 5293 during the Earthfall Cataclysm. Thassalon was founded by a benevolent emperor named Zin, who first harnessed the power of rune magic, Zin was exiled by the mystics who ruled the nation of Asland for promoting the belief that the Aslanti could learn something from and should cooperate with the other races of Galarian, particularly the elves. He and his followers left continental Asland and traveled to northwestern Avistan to establish a new nation in the area now known as Varicia. There they brought advanced civilization to the native peoples of that land, a precursor people to the Varician and Choanti people that would survive the cataclysm. This knowledge those native people would acquire from the Aslanti exiles would not survive with them. Zin also established friendly relations with the elves of the Mirani woodlands, but this friendship wouldn't survive his death. Zin was himself a great wizard, and pioneered a form of runic magic, which he taught to his disciples. Zin believed that a ruler should be guided by the seven Aslanti virtues of rule, wealth, fertility, honest pride, abundance, eager striving, righteous anger, and rest. The disciples sadly perverted these virtues in their quest for power and wealth, transforming them into the seven vices, greed, lust, pride, gluttony, envy, wrath, and sloth. After Zin's death, his disciples carved up his kingdom, and thereafter Thassalon was ruled by seven rune lords, each of whom mastered one of the seven schools of arcane rune magic, harnessed from the very sins of mankind. At the time of the fall of Thassalon, the kingdoms of the rune lords were Adasaru, the realm of envy, ruled by rune lord Belimarius. Cyrusian, the realm of pride, ruled by rune lord Xandergul. Bakrakan, the realm of wrath, ruled by rune lord Alaznist. Shalast, the realm of greed, ruled by rune lord Karzug. Gastash, the realm of gluttony, ruled by rune lord Zutha. Haruka, the realm of sloth, ruled by rune lord Kroon. Eurythnia, the realm of lust, ruled by rune lord Sorshin. In minus 5293, the Starstone came crashing down into the inner sea. The elves fled by way of the Ayudara. The Callborn abandoned the city of Kermaga and traveled deep into the Darklands to survive the cataclysm. But Thassalon, its corrupt rune lords, and their entire civilization were destroyed. 
During the Age of Darkness, Varicia was a hostile, frightening place, and for those humans still around after the Cataclysm, their priority was simply survival. Towards the end of the Age of Darkness, the Dwarves first emerged onto the surface, and in Varicia they established the Sky Citadel of Yanderhof, and laid claim to much of the Mindspin Mountains. As the dust clouds and ash began to clear, and Galarian entered into the period known as the Age of Anguish, two human ethnic groups emerged to be the dominant peoples of this land. Varicia became the homeland of the Varician people, a semi-settled nomadic people that traveled the length and breadth of the western coast of Varicia, and the Shoanti people who settled into the fertile river basins beneath the Storval Plateau. The nomadic Varicians established a number of caravan routes throughout Varicia, which have turned into major roads in modern times. These include the lengthy Yondabakari Road from Magnamar to Kermaga, the Crimson Coast Road from the Minespin Mountains to the Yondabakari along the Corvosan coast, and the Sirusibakari, a frigid road which winds north from Riddleport to the city of Yol in the land of the Linarm Kings, as well as many others. Modern History of Varicia For a long time, Varicia was considered a cultural backwater by both the southern kingdoms and also the Ulfen of the Linarm lands. In fact, as Varicia lacked any significant coastal settlements to raid, Ulfen raiders traditionally bypassed the region altogether in favor of attacking the southern kingdoms, although both Varician caravans and Shoanti settlements were sometimes targeted by northern raiders. Even as relatively late as the Age of Destiny and the early parts of the Age of Enthronement, the native people of Varicia were relatively insulated from southern expansion. This was because the frightening nation of Nidal, as well as the natural border created by the Minespin Mountains, separated them from the Empire of Taldor and later the Empire of Cheliax. This would all change during the Cheliax Everwar expansion. Chelish expansion took it increasingly northward, conquering both the land of Nidal on the western side of the Minespin and the lands that would become Malthun and Nirmathus on the eastern side. Once they conquered these lands, the Chelish conquerors discovered that there is a safe path between the mine spins that connects Nidal, Nirmathus, and southern Varicia, it is the path through the Bloodsworn Vale. And through this path, the lush, fertile lands of Varicia's southern river basins became the target of Chelish interests. In 4407, a group of Chelish marines under the command of Field Marshal Jacthian Corvosa discovered the ruins of the Thessalonian city of Zinurithnia, which was once ruled by Sorshin, the rune lord of Lust. In the time since Earthfall, Eurythnia had become a Shoanti settlement, with the still-standing ruins of the great ziggurat of Eurythnia serving as a sacred site to the clans that lived around it. Field Marshal Corvosa recognized the pyramid was a defensible structure, and that the wide Jigari Bay would be a defensible point from naval attacks, while also allowing the location to be easily resupplied by ships from Nidal. He selected the site for the construction of a defensive outpost. First, however, he had to move out the local primitive people. The Shoanti fought the invaded Chelish tooth and nail, but in time, Corvosa's army was bolstered by another Chelish expedition, this one led by Montlari and Jigare, for which the bay is named. A bitter battle ensued between the Chelish soldiers and the Shoanti natives, but in the end, the Chelish won and drove the Shoanti northwards up into the Cinderlands. The natives defeated, the Chelish explorers settled in and founded Fort Corvosa. Once complete, Fort Corvosa acted as a common stop for explorers, settlers, and trappers operating in the region. The fort had its share of trials and setbacks, including regular clashes with Shoanti, orcs, bogards, and a disastrous fire started by Shoanti saboteurs that burned down half the city. After the Great Fire of 4429, the trading post and its defenses were strengthened, and the Corvosans established the Sable Company, a standing army for the defense of Corvosa. By 4488, with the defeat of Chieftain Galstek's seven deaths of the Sun Clan, the Shoanti were forced to retreat out of the river basins altogether, and had been pushed into the Cinderlands, where they have lived ever since. With this conclusive victory over the Shoanti, Fort Corvosa's leading families felt safe enough to lay claim to the surrounding hinterlands. More flocked to the city, and over the next twelve years, the population of Fort Corvosa nearly doubled, bringing it to almost 8,000 citizens. By 4500, Corvosan expansion had led them to having dealings with the ancient city of Kermaga. The ancient city, built of solid stone, had survived the Earthfall Cataclysm and become a haven for lost travelers and misfits during the Age of Destiny. A number of Varician townships just below the Storval Plateau had sworn fealty to the great city, and these became contested lands as Corvosan interests turned northwards. 
In 4502, Corvosan politics turned inwards during a civil struggle called the Cousins War, when the Corvosan nobility turned in on itself in an effort to establish correct succession for rulership of the city. Eventually, the infighting came to an end with the aid of arbiters from Cheliax establishing Amicius Viamio as the new Lord Magistrate. Also, at around this time, Verician settlers established a secret pirate haven in a secluded rocky harbor situated at the easternmost reaches of the Kalfiak Mountains, where the meandering Velashu River meets the sea. This location would serve as a secure base from which to conduct raids against Chelish merchant vessels bound for Corvosa. In 4558, Captain Cabrium Maskir took over the settlement and became the first overlord of Riddleport. In 4584, a knight of Aradin named Alcadian Indros led an expedition into western Versia and discovered the ruins of the Irespan. He established a small outpost there after he and his companions were accosted by a sea monster when they made camp in the ruins. Indros himself managed to slay the beast, and he declared that this place would thenceforth be named Magnamar, or Stone of the Sea. Finally, we get to 4606, the death of prophecy. Aradin died. The Empire of Cheliax descended into civil war. Corvosa also became divided between two factions, loyalists and traditionalists. During this time of infighting, the magistrate of Corvosa, Arbust Arabasti, wisely maintained a strictly neutral stance on the civil war, looking to the city's own internal problems first. Fearing another bloody civil war in the streets of Corvosa, so soon after the devastating Cousins War, as tensions continued to rise between the two factions, the leader of the traditionalist faction, Alcadian Indros, the same knight who had discovered the Irespan some twenty years earlier, decided to lead his people away from the city. This migration occurred in 4608, and this transformed the outpost of Magnamar into a much larger settlement, and would lead to it eventually becoming the second largest city in the region. Despite being the leader of the royalist movement, which was committed to staying integrated with Cheliax, Lord Magistrate Arbust Arabasti continued to remain uninvolved in the broader civil war to the south, and he oversaw the peaceful exodus of Sir Indros and his people to Magnamar. Lord Magistrate Arbust Arabasti passed away in 4624 and was succeeded by his eldest son, the new Lord Magistrate Eodred Arabasti. Meanwhile, in Cheliax proper, the House of Thrun struck a bargain with the Lords of Nadal to revert them to independence in order to win the war. Corvosa was therefore cut off from the rest of the empire and became, almost by de facto, an independent state. Queen Abigail I was crowned the new Queen of Cheliax in 4640, but by then even the royalist faction was having doubts about remaining integrated with Cheliax. In 4644, a summit of the noble lords of Corvosa met and discussed the situation, and collectively decided Lord Magistrate Eodred Arabasti should be crowned King of Independent Corvosa, the first king of the Crimson Throne. With the matter of Corvosan independence resolved, the city turned its interests back to the northern townships which Kermaga laid claim to. This culminated in the Prince's War between Corvosa and Kermaga, which ended in 4663 with the signing of the Treaty of Sirathu. In addition to pledging continued peace, Kermaga ceded all territories below the Sorval rise to Corvosa. Although tensions have continued, the treaty is yet to be broken. Corvosan control therefore extended to the townships of Sirathu, Abkin, Biston, Melfesh, Baselweef, Hars, Palin's Cove, Veldrain, and Fort Thorn in the Bloodsworn Vale. After Corvosan control of the region was secured, Queen Domina Arabasti, who ruled Corvosa from 4667 to 4686, decided to enforce Corvosan law throughout the region by persuading the Hell Knights of the Order of the Nail to relocate to Verissia in 4682. They established Citadel Vraid as their headquarters, and have remained in service to the Corvosan monarchy ever since. Meanwhile, Magnamar continued its growth and prosperity, having expanded its influence to the towns of Sandpoint, Wardle, Nybor, Galduria, Wolfseer, and by 4693, as far north as Ravenmoor. Only the towns around Lake Sarantula and along the Skull River have remained independent of both Corvosa and Magnamar. Finally, the most recent events in the region are played out in the Return of the Rune Lord's Adventure Path, which is set in the year 4718. In this adventure, the heroes challenge the return of the Rune Lord of Wrath, Alasnist. They work against him by allying themselves with Sorshan, the former Rune Lord of Lust. By the end of the adventure, Sorshan establishes a country in the north of Verissia called New Thassalon, and our capital is established at Zin Edasaril, on Peridot Isle. Today, Verissia proper remains a non-united land. 
though power is increasingly consolidated in the four city-states of Corvosa in the southeast, Magnamar in the southwest, Riddleport in the northwest, and Kermaga in the Storval Plateau. Still, much of the land remains wild and untamed, and the Storval Plateau in particular is often being fought over by orcs from Belksen, who have established the large settlement of Erglin in the region, and the Shoanti, who can now be found all over the plateau. Politics in Varicia Next, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the four city-states of Varicia today. I'm also going to touch on the communities of the elves and dwarves in Varicia, and finally provide a little more detail around the relatively young kingdom of New Thassalon. Magnamar We're going to start with Magnamar. Foreigners sometimes think of Varicia as a united nation, and if they do so, they are thinking primarily of the Magnamari. That's because, although it is only the second largest city in Varicia, Corvosa's history is so deeply tied to that of Cheliax that many confuse it for Chelish colony. Riddleport, the third largest city, is a haven for pirates, so people tend to think of it as a lawless exception to Varician rule, and Kermaga is so strange a city that it's barely understood, even by those who have experienced it. The net result here is that increasingly, foreigners confuse Varician national identity, but not ethnic identity, with Magnamari national identity. And frankly, the Magnamari do little to dissuade others of that notion, for they already believe that in Magnamar they have the beginnings of a true Varician kingdom that will one day unify the land. Magnamar's flag features the iconic Irespan Bridge, with an angel hovering over it. Its national colors are white and sky blue. It is often referred to as the City of Monuments, because of its many large monuments and historic structures, including the Guardian Statues, the Eyes of the Hawk Monument, the Grand Arch, and of course, the Irespan itself. The Irespan is an ancient Thessalonian ruin, the easternmost end of a giant bridge which has now crumbled into the sea. This enormous relic stretches from Magnamar's other most noticeable feature, the 300-foot-tall cliff which cuts the city in two, known as the Sea Cleft. While the cliff and bridge provide natural dividers to the city's major districts, the summit atop the cliff, the shore below, and the shadow under the Irespan, residents recognize nine city districts within Magnamar. The wealthiest communities in Magnamar are located in the summit, atop the rise of Sea Cleft, as are the city's centers of government, education, and arts. The summit contains the following three districts. The Alabaster District, incorporating the neighborhoods of the Marble District and the Stylobate. This is a residential district, catering to the city's nobility and most wealthy merchant class. The Capital District, incorporating the neighborhood of Bridgeward. The buildings of this area are as ornate as they are important. The Usher's Hall, which sits opposite the monument known as Indros Kulvidrark. It is home to the Council of Ushers, and is the place where many of the city's most important decisions are made. Nearby stands the Pediment Building, the home of Justice in Magnamar. The above-ground floors are home to stern-faced judges and large courtrooms, while below the ground is Magnamar's main prison, the Hells. Naos District, incorporating the neighborhoods of Grand Arch and Vista, Disparagingly called the New Money District by the city's more established nobles, the Naos is actually one of the nicest, best-maintained parts of the city. The district is home to both great public spaces like the Star Silver Plaza and the Lord Mayor's Menagerie, and great buildings like the Triodea and the Hydemark Manor, which serves as a lodge for members of the Pathfinder Society. The Shadow District is the most derelict in the city, and houses only the single city district of Underbridge. It is home to the seediest of Magnamar's inhabitants, and most members of the government take an out-of-sight, out-of-mind approach to the district's problems. The Shore is home to the majority of Magnamar's working class, and it contains Magnamar's coasts and docks and the following five city districts. Beacons Point, incorporating the neighborhood of Rags End. It is sometimes called the Shipyard or the Workers' District. As may be expected of a district that deals with hardy seafolk, it is loud and raucous. Beacons Point is home to many dock-working families, as well as numerous sailors and other ocean-goers. It also houses numerous warehouses, shipping concerns, and other such businesses. The most famous landmark of Beacons Point is its statue-studded lighthouse, the Worm Watch, which was supposedly built upon the very spot where Alcadian Indros vanquished the Vidrark. Dockway, also sometimes referred to as the Eagle's Quarter, or as the Trade District. It is said Dockway never sleeps. The constant flow of trading ships and local fishing vessels keep the docks busy at all hours. Much of this part of the city is home to businesses that cater to the hardy sea folk who spend their earnings here. A few blocks inland from the salt-soaked dock fronts, there are a host of more comfortable inns and taverns that try to cater to the exotic tastes of Magnamar's foreign visitors. The most famous of these dockway sanctuaries is probably the Fang, a popular dockside inn. Keystone, incorporating the neighborhoods of the Marches and Silvershore. 
The marches serve as the entrance to Magnamar for most of the land-bound travelers who enter the city. The castle gate is the first sight many traders see when approaching Magnamar, and is one of the only four gates which penetrate the city wall. As might be expected from a major thoroughfare of trade, it is a neighborhood filled with Zarni gangs and other such thieves and conmen. Luckily, the local churches of Ayamade, Erastal, and Abadar all provide manpower that help keep the district safe, or at least safer than it would be otherwise. Keystone's other neighborhood, Silvershore, is instead mainly home to well-off merchants, members of the Council of Ushers, and several noble families who have decided to base themselves by the shore. As well as for its residents, Silvershore is renowned for the bizarre Aquaritum, created by a gnome inventor to serve as something halfway between a museum and an aquarium. Lowcleft, or the Rubble, as it is often disparagingly known, sits at the bottom of the imposing sea cleft, and is considered one of Magnamar's most vibrant neighborhoods. It is the home of avant-garde artists and performers of all sorts, and is filled with small theaters, tap rooms, hookah bars, dance halls, and even brothels. Venues in this part of town tend to show off performances too innovative or shocking for the more famous Triodia Theater, though there is still a connection between the Triodia and Lowcleft performers. One of Lowcleft's most infamous night spots, the Gilded Cage, is run by a former Triodia prima donna, Jaylene Mordove. Ordelia, incorporating Kyver's Islet. Ordelia serves as a hotbed of dissent and new political ideas. The people of this district view themselves as embodying the spirit of freedom that led Alcadian Indros to originally found Magnamar. The people of the district are proud of their community, organized militia, and other services, viewing themselves as a separate entity to the rest of the city. The beating heart of this community-wide spirit is the Rose and the Rake Theatre, renowned for its satirical and often scathing plays which target local political figures. Magnamar is ruled by two official political bodies, the Council of Ushers and the Office of the Lord Mayor. This two-tiered system was established at the city's founding to ensure that no single person ever had too much control. Despite the idealist intentions of the city's founders, over the last century both offices have become power-hungry and less effective at representing the needs of the city-state citizens. The Council of Ushers The Council of Ushers serves as the legislature of Magnamar and currently contains 117 members. Of these, many are nobles whose families have held seats for generations, back to the time when the council was but 15 members large. With many more seats now than there are noble families, dozens of seats are filled with scheming merchants and greedy power seekers, as well as a frustrated number of genuinely altruistic activists and honest merchants all vying to have their personal causes heard and passed into law. The council meets in the austere Ushers Hall in the capital district. Office of the Lord Mayor in theory, restricted by the Council of Ushers, the Lord Mayor is by far the most powerful person in Magnamar. This immense power normally results in corruption. Many of Magnamar's political matters are determined not by who is right, or at least most persuasive, but by who brings the Lord Mayor the most lavish and impressive bribe. While in theory the Lord Mayor must uphold the mandates of the Council of Ushers, previous Lord Mayor Haldmir Groberas frequently ignored them when they were not to his liking. The current Lord Mayor is Sabria Kalmaral, who was elected to the post after Grobris's mysterious death in 4719. Sabria herself is in her mid-forties, and is renowned for her noble demeanor and razor-sharp wit. She is also known for her temper and her long memory for those who have wronged her. Prior to her election as Lord Mayor, she was known to the merchants of the Bazaar of Sales as the Princess of Markets, and was responsible for policing Magnamar's busiest bazaars. The Justice Court when legal arbitration is needed above and beyond what the city guard themselves can handle, the legal system of Magnamar calls upon the Justice Court. This body of 13 justices is the highest court in the city-state, and rules on disagreements as well as the guilt and innocence of those accused of particularly heinous crimes. The court meets in the Pediment Building, which also serves as a prison for the city's most hardened criminals, located in a dungeon deep beneath the building. Compared to its sister city of Corvosa, Magnamar tends to put few restrictions on trade and traders. It openly encourages the formation of trade guilds, and generally is a place where almost anyone, given good connections and a healthy amount of luck, can make something of him or herself. Because of these attitudes, even though Magnamar is still smaller than Corvosa in terms of both population and trade, it may soon grow to outstrip its neighbor. Corvosa. Corvosa is the largest city in Varicia, and used to be the capital of Chelish colonized Varicia. It now serves as the seat of one of the three city-states that claim independent authority over their individual holdings in the region. Though its citizens and traditions have strong ties to the nation of Cheliacs, with many of its people tracing their ancestry directly to servants of the empire, it is in fact truly independent of House Thrun's brutal imperialist regime. Despite this, Magnamarians still disparagingly refer to Corvosa as Little Cheliacs. 
Corvosa's flag features the Corvosan coat of arms, which includes a hippogriff and a fish, as well as a closed portcullis gate and five golden suns, each representing one of the city's five great houses. Although the flag shares colors with the nation of Cheliacs, Corvosans tend to favor the colors of red and silver to show national pride, red to relate to their origins in old imperial Cheliacs, while silver is a symbol of the city's importance and wealth. Corvosa's official mascot is the Hippogriff, dozens of which roost in the Great Tower and serve as mounts for the soldiers of the Sable Company. The city's motto is Trosker Epstirk, which in an archaic form of Taldane means fidelity and strength. The city of Corvosa is divided into seven official districts, East Shore, Grey, The Heights, Midland, North Point, Old Corvosa, and South Shore. East Shore. East Shore is the only city district on the far side of the Jigar River. It is separated from the rest of the city by Highbridge, and is home to a number of Corvosa's noble families with strong ties to the military. It is also the location of the city's second and arguably inferior magical school, Thuman Access College. The Grey District. The Grey serves as Corvosa's graveyard, and is where most of its dead are interred. The only living inhabitants are the priests of Phrasma who tend it, and reside in the Grand Cathedral of Phrasma. The Heights. The Heights sits atop Citadel Hill, and the cliffs of Corvosa's western shoreline. It is home to the most powerful nobles in the city, including the monarch, as Castle Corvosa is located within its borders. The Academy, Corvosa's most well-respected magical college, can be found here as well. As the highest district in the city, its residents feel they can look down on the rest of Corvosa, both literally and figuratively. Midland. Midland is what most visitors think of when they speak of Corvosa. Located in the southeast quadrant of the city, it is home to the majority of Corvosa's merchants, shops, and financial institutions. The criminal elements who might prey on this accumulation of wealth are kept in check by the fact that both the headquarters of the Corvosan Guard and the Sable Company are located here as well. North Point. North Point was the first part of the mainland to be settled after the city began to expand from Andrew Nile. Encompassing the northeastern quadrant of the city, it is home to many families descended from these early settlers, in addition to much of Corvosa's municipal infrastructure, including City Hall, the Courts, and the Bank of Abadar. Old Corvosa. Old Corvosa, as the name implies, is the oldest, but also the poorest, most overcrowded part of the city. It encompasses all of Endrin Isle, and is dominated by Garrison Hill. The shanty town of Bridgefront is located on the western part of the island. South Shore. The newest district of the city, South Shore was only founded at the end of the 47th century. Located on the southwestern edge of the mainland Corvosa, next to the Grey District, it does not suffer from the overcrowding that plagues the rest of the city. Because of this, it is a highly sought-after residence for the city's new money elite. It is also home to the Pantheon of Many, Corvosa's ecumenical cathedral. The Shingles. Built on top of the rooftops of Corvosa's most densely populated areas lie wooden walkways, ramshackle abodes, and shops known as the Shingles. Due to the city's severe overcrowding, the area is home to some of the city's poorest citizens, as well as providing quick highways over the bustling streets for anyone wishing to avoid the crowds. The Vaults the vaults run beneath mainland Corvosa, and are far more than just sewers. They incorporate the ruins of two other settlements previously located here. Despite its remote location in relation to other major cities in Avastan, Corvosa is nonetheless a major commercial player in Galarian, and is a gateway for trade throughout Varicia. Its primary exports are seafood, such as oysters, the narrows of St. Alica are famous for their oyster beds, reef claw claws, caviar, and so on. Also, in the high-end foodstuffs department, Corvosa exports thilio bark to Cheliacs at ridiculously high prices. It also exports goods made in its vassal states, and is the only port that ships off Yanderhof's goods. Thanks to the impressively large Bank of Abadar, Corvosa is also an important banking and financial city, which mints its own currency. Thanks to the presence of the Academy, Corvosa is also a supplier of magical items, especially low-level ones, utilizing the School of Conjuration. The Arcona family imports a lot of items from distant Vudra, which are then distributed throughout northern and western Avistan. Finally, as much of the government is loath to admit, Corvosa has a pretty impressive drug trade, although it mainly imports such goods. Corvosa's food supplies come from the farms around it and its vassal community, although it does import food that can't grow in its climate. Wine is a major import, for example, as are tropical and subtropical fruits. The majority of Corvosa's imports, though, are in manufactured goods, Despite the presence of the ironworks in the city, Corvosa's capacity to produce finished goods lags well behind its demand, and despite being separate from it, it still imports a lot of such goods from Cheliacs. Textiles are another example of that need. 
According to Corvosus' charter, no guilds or trade unions may be formed within the city. This law was designed to keep groups from price fixing, but also allow the city to maintain direct control over its labor force. Most craftsmen in the city are self-employed and learn their trade through apprenticeship from a master in their youth. The government of Corvosa is comprised of three official branches, each with its own unique sphere of influence. In addition, Corvosa's noble families exert limited power in the affairs of government. At the top of this structure is the monarchy, the king or queen of the Crimson Throne, which rules over Corvosa and its holdings and townships in the surrounding countryside. Alongside the monarchy are the arbiters. They hold the responsibility of legislative oversight over decisions made by the other branches of Corvosa's government. The arbiters of Corvosa are responsible for hearing disputes and crimes and determining punishments for those deemed guilty. Corvosa's magistrates are in charge of the daily management of the city, including taxation, economic oversight, and public works. Garrick Tan, the magistrate of commerce, is one of the least popular, as one of his duties is to act as the city's chief tax collector. In contrast, Silgar, the magistrate of expenditures, is one of the most popular, as he is responsible for spending the taxes on the city's behalf. There are many others besides these two, with 23 magistrate seats in total to provide governance for the city. The monarchy is also advised by the Peerage Review, a council composed of the heads of Corvosa's five great houses. Traditionally, these five houses were House Arabasti. Until recently, Arabasti had held the monarchy and the Crimson Throne since its establishment. After the death of Queen Iliosa in 4708, the new queen, Cressida Croft, traced no noble lineage at all, but had been the field marshal of the Corvosan Guard prior to her coronation. King Eodred and Queen Iliosa produced no natural heirs. House Bromathan was one of the smaller noble houses, who served frequently in the Sable Company. They represent a lineage that devoted itself to the goddess Sarenre after the death of Aradin. House Jagar, an ancient and powerful house with ties back to imperial Cheliacs. This branch of House Jagar survives the sometimes cutthroat politics of Corvosa by keeping a line of credit open for the monarch and other noble families, and by acting as the chief financial backer of both the Corvosan Guard and the Sable Company. House Larung. Even before Jessa Larung founded the University of Corvosa, the ancient and esteemed House Larung served Cheliacs as teachers, instructors, professors, scholars, and sages. To this day, House Larung maintains extensive libraries in the cities across the regions controlled by old Cheliacs, and controls both the University of Agorian in Cheliacs and Almas University in Andoran, where the family's noble standing is no longer recognized, but its contributions to academia are. House Ornelos. Not just one of the most politically powerful noble houses in Corvosa, House Ornelos also controls the Academy, the city's magical university, and many of the signs of House Ornelos are gifted arcane spellcasters and devil binders in the Diabolus tradition. House Zenderholm Only 30 years after its arrival within Corvosa at the tail end of the Cousins' War, House Zenderholm displaced House Fordyce as a great house, making it the first of that title to not also be a dock family. Today, House Center home members serve as the city's arbiters, magistrates, lawyers, and diplomats. The remaining 21 noble houses comprise the dock families, each boasting control over one or more of the city's docks. A notable family among these is the Vudrin family, which has taken the name House Arcona, which controls much of Old Corvosa. Other influential people in Corvosa include the Seneschal of Corvosa, who commands the Royal Guard and is chief advisor to the king or queen the Commandant of the Sable Company, Corvosa's Standing Army, the Field Marshal of the Corvosan Guard, which are the City Watch, or Police, and the Lictor of the Order of the Nail, who rules over Citadel Vraid, the Black Iron Fortress of the Hell Knights, an autonomous legion of lawbringers seeking to enforce its own harsh vision of order upon Verissia, meaning out law with blade and iron-shod boot. Riddleport Riddleport is the third largest city in Verissia, and its most northern port. The city is a haven for pirates and seafaring brigands. Riddleport is full of potential danger and hard to avoid intrigue. Also known as the City of Ciphers, Riddleport takes its name from the Cipher Gate, a giant stone arch spanning the natural cove around which the city is built. This ancient structure is covered on both sides with ancient Thessalonian symbols, although their exact meaning is unknown. Riddleport's flag features the Cipher Gate, displayed on a beige canvas. The gendarme, or gentlemen at arms, who serve as the city watch, use a symbol of a key and a sword as their badge of office, in a bright gold color. Although the official colors of the state are pale yellow, tan, or beige, citizens of Riddleport don't particularly feel a need to wave the flag or wear these colors, even when they are traveling abroad and representing the city in an official capacity. Riddleport is divided into a total of nine separate districts, although two of them, Lubbertown and the Boneyard, technically lie outside of the overlord's jurisdiction. 
The Free Coin District. Overlord Cromarkey's three grand game halls are located in this part of the city, along the northwestern shore of the Velasu River. The Leeward District. The city's largest district, Leeward is built into the protective curve of the city's eastern ridge, where it is sheltered from the worst of the winter winds. The majority of the city's population resides in the tall tenements of this district, and most buildings have a shop at street level where standard goods and services can be obtained. Lubbertown. Known derisively as Lubbertown for the fact that most of its inhabitants arrive at the city by land rather than by sea, this district is not patrolled by the gendarme and has developed its own social order, informal system of laws, and distribution of goods and employment. The Boneyard. This deceptively named place actually serves as the city's dump and ship graveyard. Its name is derived from the many old hulks and collections of ships' ribs that protrude from the swampy ground. The whole area is a partially flooded salt marsh. Monstrous cockroaches, swamp barracuda, and, it is whispered, were-rats infest this area. The River District. This section of town runs along the banks of the Velashu River and consists primarily of shops and mills. Riddleport's atrophied trade items are crafted in this district. The waste produced by the district tanners and fishmongers and the fact that many of the city's sewage gutters converge here have earned the place the unofficial name of Reek District. The Rotgut District. The slums of Riddleport are a truly depressing and dangerous place to be. Easily the poorest section of the city proper, Rotgut also hosts the highest crime rate and the most brothels and alehouses per capita. It lies along the city's eastern side against the ridge. The Devil's Fork. The small military district is nestled near the north end of the city on an on an island in the Velashu River. It serves above as barracks for the Riddleport's 250 gendarmes and below as a prison for the city's malcontents. The Wharf District. This rough and tumble district lies hard on the edge of the very docks of the city and is where much of the city's day-to-day -day action of commerce and thievery occurs. Nearest the docks are a series of warehouses and cheap grog houses where merchant and pirate crews alike mingle in a haze of rum-soaked blood and debauchery. Windward District. Built on the slopes of the city's western ridgeline, this is Riddleport's affluent district. The buildings here are generally quite tall, and its streets winding and steep. The majority of the city's scholars and sages dwell in this windy district. Most people see Riddleport as an anarchic abode of pirates and brigands, but the city has actually become quite a bit more stable in recent years. This is in large part due to the work and leadership of the titular head of Riddleport, the overlord Gaston Cromarkey. Cromarkey has held the title of Overlord for over three decades, having inherited it the usual way, by murdering the pirate captain who held it before him. At the beginning of his reign, he used what funds were left over from the previous Overlord to hire land-based mercenaries to maintain law within the city. These men were beholden only to him, and allowed Cromarkey to consolidate quite a bit of power in his office. Cromarkey rules over the city with a light touch, and with the consent and help of several powerful figures. When the time comes to choose a new overlord, he will likely be chosen from among these supporters. Unlike its more civic-minded neighbors to the south, Magnamar and Corvosa, Riddleport has only a single holding, the small town of Roderick's Cove. Despite the relative danger of the city, scholars and academics are also fairly common in the city, as the mysterious and massive Cyphergate represents a seemingly endless supply of research material for those interested in Thessalonian relics. The presence of these scholars and mages seems to have added a tempering agent to the otherwise anarchic mix of pirates and cutthroats. The city also supports a sizable tiefling population, possibly the largest in Varicia. Kaer Maga Standing atop one of the highest spots of the Storval Rise, the cliff-top city of Kaer Maga is built inside the ruins of an ancient fortress. A six-sided ring of 80-foot-high seamless stone stretching more than a half a mile in diameter and topped with towers of every shape and design. Also known as the Asylum Stone, Kirmaga has served as a refuge for exiles, misfits, and never-do-wells, fleeing persecution and prosecution for thousands of years, and is known throughout Galarian as a place where anyone can fit in, and where anything can be bought and sold. The first thing a traveler to Kirmaga sees is the cliff. Towering 3,000 feet high in places, and never dipping below a thousand, carved with the faces and forms of vanished kings and gods, the Storval Rise neatly bisects the frontier land of Rissia along a massive tectonic fault line, separating the lush lowlands of the coast from the arid and pitiless badlands of the Storval Plateau. Stark and forbidding, these rocky bluffs are unclimbable by all but the most daring, leading those who seek passage out of the civilized lands to ascend carefully along the edge of the Yondabakari River, which cuts a channel through the stone, or else to turn north and head straight for Kermaga herself, hoping to brave the legendary Half-Light Path. From a distance, Kermaga appears to be an enormous outcropping of gleaming white stone, extending straight up from the cliff's edge, 
its 80-foot high walls forming a seamless six-sided ring, and its squared-off skyline broken only by a cluster of towers and minarets at the south end. Upon closer inspection, however, the great walls are revealed to be riddled with holes at every level, doors and windows carved out by its residents. From these random entrances hang knotted ropes and ladders, cargo nets and winch-operated dumbwaiters, which residents use to come and go without a second thought. Even children swing stories above the ground and scamper across makeshift landings. Abandoned by the strange entities that crafted it millennia ago, the city has become a sanctuary for misfits and strays. The entire city is a melting pot of citizens from all cultures, such as Verissians, Shoanti, Orcs, and Goblins, and even Centaurs and Naga. The wealthy Ardok family of Bis, the brothers of the Seal who are ready to kill each other over whether they should open the great portal they guard somewhere deep in the caverns beneath. The gently whistling sweet talkers of Chan who have their lips sewn shut. The augurs, troll seers who predict the future by casting divinations with their own intestines, and the bloat mages, with the leeches that keep them alive attached to their bulging bodies. The city also has a sizable population of mindless undead, sometimes referred to as the twice born. The vast majority of travelers to Kermaga make use of the trade roads that follow the Yondabakari up its cataracts at the top of the Storval Plateau, or else make the farther journey from the giant sized Storval stairs to the northwest. Yet for those desperate to make as much haste as possible, there remains another road, a route that twists and turns to the very rock of the cliff face, held open by the Dusk Wardens, an organization of specialized rangers who know to navigate the path and protect the city above from the threats of the Darklands. This is the Half-Light Path. Wide enough to accommodate entire caravans in single file, the trail begins at the foot of the cliff, directly beneath Kermaga, where a small but well-maintained wagon trail splits off from the river road and terminates at a bronze gate known as the Twisted Door. Ancient beyond reckoning, these immense double doors are covered in runes of an unknown language and take their name from a strange and subtle warping of their edges, which seem to rotate at strange angles yet still fit together without a gap. In a phenomenon frequently studied by visiting scholars, any given edge on the gate appears to be perfectly straight, yet as the observer follows it with his gaze, he finds his eyes have somehow turned, and what was once an outside edge is now inside. Apparently constructed by the same unknown race that founded the city itself, the twisted door remains a subject of curiosity even after millennia. Yet despite its strange nature, the twisted door is also a working gate, and the dusk wardens who guide travelers through it have little patience for sages whose experiments interfere with their regular operation. Kermaga's flag features the twisted door displayed on a navy blue canvas. The Dusk Wardens also use a version of this symbol as their badge of office, and are greatly respected throughout the city by all factions. They also wear cloaks of navy blue, making that dark blue the unofficial color of Kermaga. The city is divided into eleven districts. Eight of them are contained within the hollow stone ring, and are known collectively as the Ring Districts. The other three are in the city's open central area, and are known as the Core Districts. There is also a great network of underground tunnels and chambers known as the Undercity. The districts are Ankarte. A diverse array of citizens can be found here, including a large number of necromancers. Ankarte is a hodgepodge of cultures, and the only district in Kermaga that allows the living dead to walk the streets unmonitored. Bis. The fabled ledge manors known as the Balconies of Bis climb the walls of this immense chamber-like cliff dwelling, ruled fairly but severely by the Ardok family, a noble house of brilliant golem crafters. The Bottoms. This cliffside district is the home of the escaped slaves and abolitionist revolutionaries known as the Freemen, whose riotous celebration of democracy is matched only by the ferocity with which they defend it. Cavalcade. The industrial heart of Kermaga, cavalcade houses mills and smithies that are frequently powered by the countless streams and aqueducts that run through it. High Side Stacks. The richest and most powerful members of Kermaga exist not within the city, but rather above it, making their homes and posh towers so large and accommodating that many of their residents never set foot on the ground. Ariat. This district is the most colorful of them all, renowned for its theaters, music, nightlife, bardic college, youthful exuberance, and also, unfortunately, the sectarian warfare that regularly claims the lives of its citizens. The Tar Heel Promenade. Tar Heel Promenade features the greatest collection of clerics and temples. It is also home of the powerful Arcanist Circle. Tar Heel Promenade is one of the best markets in Verissia for items magical in nature. The Warren. Raised long ago by unknown forces, this broken section of the ring has grown into a ramshackle shantytown, seven stories tall, and is home to the city's poorest residents. The Core Districts. The following districts lie in the city's open-air center. Down Market. A constantly shifting bazaar of tents and stalls, Down Market is Kermaga's primary commercial district, where foreign caravans meet to trade with locals and each other. 
Everything is available for sale here, and nothing is too taboo for Kermaga's down market. Hospice. No city is complete without a hospitality district, and Kermaga's is among the best. Hospice offers the best and worst accommodations a visitor could ask for, and it includes an extensive red light district that caters to the most peculiar tastes. Widdershins. An island of sanity in a city of chaos, Widdershins is a quiet domestic neighborhood, in part because of the presence of the local constabulary, who are known for their rough treatment of rule breakers. To an outsider, it might seem as if Kermaga has no government at all. Yet those who observe the chaotic tumult of different cultures for any length of time realize that in fact the opposite is true. In order for Kermaga to have survived for so long without tearing itself apart, it must have a government. One of the most multifaceted and delicately balanced governments on the continent. At its heart, Kermaga is an anarcho-capitalist society, a collection of individuals who value personal autonomy over all else, and use binding contracts and match strength to keep the peace. While scholars may argue that such an arrangement is inherently unstable, and that a society without a central organization and safety nets is doomed to see its influence falter, and most of its population slip through the cracks, Kermagans are only too happy to point to the slums of cities like Corvosa and Magnamar, as well as to the steady stream of immigrants seeking refuge within Kermaga's walls. Kermaga is instead unofficially ruled by a council, each ruler belonging to one of the various districts and factions whose memberships constantly shift as different groups gain power, both mercantile and martial. Many of these groups have remained descendant for generations, and enough of them remain stable at any one point in time to put any others who might threaten that truce in their place. After all, the one thing that everyone can agree on in Kermaga is that commerce is crucial, and while business doesn't require peace, it does require a certain amount of good faith. To that end, contracts and agreements are the bedrock of Kermagan society, and the churches of both Asmodeus and Abadar work with all the guilds to make sure that oath-breaking remains one of the highest, and perhaps only, sin in the city. Elves of Varicia Elves of Varicia tend to be either forlorn elves living in human settlements, including the major cities already discussed, or Ayudin elves living in and around the Mirani forest, particularly in the elven cities of Arsemaril and Crying Leaf. The forest used to be the site of the elven capital in the west, a city called Kelwinvian. However, the city was abandoned by the Ayudin when they left Galarian during the Earthfall Cataclysm. When the Ayudin returned in 2632, they discovered that Kelwinvian had been conquered by dark, twisted versions of their former selves. These dark elves, or drow, had survived the Earthfall Cataclysm by traveling deep into the Darklands, but had become corrupted by the dark forces that lived there. The Ayudin and the Drow warred over the city for hundreds of years, before a magical spell turned wrong and poisoned the city, forcing both the Drow and the Elves to abandon it altogether. Since that time, some of the fell magic has worn off, but the city itself is still contested. The Elves of the Mirani Forest strictly prohibit outsiders from entering the city, insisting they are seeking to preserve it as a refuge from the rest of the world. But those more familiar with the region sense that the Elves themselves avoid the city, and are still involved in an ongoing war to reclaim it. Dwarves of Varicia. Similar to the elves, dwarves of Varicia tend to either be Ergaxan dwarves that migrated into the major human cities or surrounding human townships, or Holtaxan dwarves hailing from the sky citadel of Yanderhof. Yanderhof sits at the base of the forbidding Mindspin Mountains. Predominantly subterranean, Yanderhof has earned a reputation for fine metalwork, transnational trade, and dwarven culture. Mining is the predominant industry in this hulking city, and thick veins of copper, iron, silver, and black marble fuel its robust economy. Every year, the dwarven miners also produce a small amount of mithril, a rarity they keep to themselves. Centuries of experience have honed the city's metalworking industry, and smiths from Yanderhof are renowned for their skill. Yanderhof trades heavily with Corvosa, which provides the tunnel dwellers with their only shipping outlet. The dwarves also act as an intermediary between the Corvosans and their bitter rivals, the Shawanti. This frequently forces the dwarves to serve as diplomatic go-betweens. Dwarven envoys must often defuse tense situations in order to maintain the peace between these valuable trading partners. As a sky citadel, the city of Yanderhof is a hotspot for dwarven culture and religion. Worship of Torag, god of the forge, is especially prevalent, and Yanderhof boasts one of the largest holy forges in Varicia. The temple's forge is said to produce some of the finest weaponry on Galarian, and only master smiths are allowed the honor of working its bellows. The Sky Citadel of Kragadan and the fortress city of the Glimmerhold are also very close to Varicia, and dwarven traders and travelers can be found from these cities as well. New Thassalon New Thassalon is a young nation located in northwestern Avistan, founded by the surviving rune lords of ancient Thassalon. New Thassalon's territory is a sparsely populated stretch of land encompassing most of the Kodar Mountains in northern Varicia. Its flag features a golden star on a cerulean blue canvas. It is further divided into two regions. 
Eurythnia, which stretches from its capital Zinshalas to the western coast, and Adasaril, which consists of Peridot Isle and the deserted southern half of the iron-bound archipelago, and the area surrounding the Mirani forest. The two realms share a disputed border. Eurythnia is ruled by the former rune lord Sorshin, who does not involve herself with the life of her subjects. She and her benefactor, the former demon lord Nocticula, seek to fashion Eurythnia and Euthaslon as a whole into a place where exiles, subversive artists, and misfits can call home. Having seen the deaths of her rivals who attempted to rule the modern world by force, as they did in ancient Thaslon, Sorshin seeks to avoid following in their footsteps, and to coexist peacefully with New Thaslon's neighbors. Bellimarius, rune lord of Envy and ruler of Adasaril, continues to view nearby nations with jealousy. Sorshin knows that Bellimarius is unstable, might threaten New Thaslon's peaceful existence, and will have to be dealt with eventually, but Sorshin allows her rival to forge her own fate, and refuses to voice her dissent for now. Adasaril, the more aggressive of New Thaslon's two kingdoms, quickly found itself in conflict with the elves of the Mirani Forest and the Lenorm Kingdom of the Ironbound Islands. Bellimarius's first major act as a ruler was to overthrow the highly unpopular Lenorm king Opier Eightfingers, whose realm of Southmoor lay just north of Adasaril. In Eurythnia, the Nolans experienced immense development. Brinewall became a thriving port, and travel between the lands of the Lenorm kings and Varicia grew. The Church of Nocticula, whose dogma aligns with Sorshin's politics, holds power nearly equal to that of a state religion. Many arcane spellcasters in New Thaslon are developing a new magical tradition, melding those of Old Thaslon with new techniques, and have adapted the title of Rune Lord for themselves. A vocal and quickly growing faction among these modern Rune Lords seek to emulate the ancient Rune Lord's evil ways. Some pledge their service to Bellimarius, or seek to undermine Sorshin, but most view themselves as rightful rulers, most notably Ithusa who claims to be the reincarnation of two rune lords of the same name. These modern rune lords are opposed by a faction who see ancient Thassalon's wisdom and lore, but understand that their evil ways ultimately led to their defeat, and are more concerned with exploring their magical potential. Thanks for watching. That's a wrap for us here on the region of Varicia. Uh, we're going to be coming back to this series in a little bit, but what we got coming up next is more on the gods and goddesses. We're going to be tackling Gorham. We're going to be tackling Caden Kalian. So if you've been waiting for those, they're coming. Don't worry. If you enjoyed this content today, please be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.